Uh, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Uh, you know, it's the last time we get together before Christmas and, and year end, so enjoy your holiday season. I'm very pleased to welcome you to our press conference. I will now report on uh, the outcome of today's meeting of the Governing Council, which was also attended by the Commission Vice President, Mr. Wren. Based on our regular economic and monetary analysis, we decided to keep the key ECB interest rates unchanged. Incoming information and analysis have confirmed our assessment and monetary policy decisions of last month. Underlying price pressures in the euro area are expected to remain subdued over the medium term. In keeping with this picture, monetary and credit dynamics remain subdued. At the same time, inflation expectations for the euro area over the medium term, over the medium to long term, continue to be firmly anchored. In line with our aim to maintain inflation rates below but close to 2%. Such a constellation suggests that we may experience a prolonged period of low inflation to be followed by a gradual upward movement towards inflation rates below but close to 2% later on. Our monetary policy stance will remain accommodative for as long as necessary and will thereby continue to assist the gradual economic recovery in the euro area. In this context, the Governing Council confirmed its forward guidance that it continues to expect the key ECB interest rates to remain at present or lower levels for an extended period of time. This expectation continues to be based on an overall subdued outlook for inflation extending into the medium term, given the broad-based weakness of the economy and subdued monetary dynamics. With regard to money market conditions and their potential impact on our monetary policy stance, we are monitoring developments closely and are ready to consider all available instruments. Let me now explain our assessment in greater detail, starting with economic analysis. Following a rise of 0.3% in the second quarter of 2013, real GDP in the euro area increased by 0.1 quarter on quarter in the third quarter. Developments in survey based confidence indicators up to November are consistent with a positive growth rate also in the fourth quarter of the year. Looking ahead to 2014 and 2015, output is expected to recover at a slow pace, in particular owing to some improvement in domestic demand supported by accommodative monetary policy stance. Euro area economic activity should, in addition, benefit from a gradual strengthening of demand for exports. Furthermore, the overall improvements in financial markets seen since last year appear to be working their way through to the real economy, as should the progress made in fiscal consolidation. In addition, real incomes have benefited recently from lower energy price inflation. At the same time, unemployment in the euro area remains high, and the necessary balance sheet adjustments in the public and the private sector will continue to weigh on economic activity. This assessment is also reflected in the December 2013 Eurosystem staff macroeconomic projections for the euro area, which foresee annual real GDP declining by 0.4% in 2013 before increasing by 1.1% in 2014 and 1.5% in 2015. 
Compared with the September 2013 ECB staff macroeconomic projections, the projection for real GDP growth for 2013 has remained unchanged, and it has been revised upwards by 0.1 percentage point for 2014. The risks surrounding the economic outlook for the euro area are assessed to be on the downwards, on the downside. Developments in global money and financial market conditions and related uncertainties may have the potential to negatively affect economic conditions. Other downside risks include higher commodity prices, weaker than expected domestic demand and export growth, and slow or insufficient implementation of structural reforms in euro area countries. According to Eurostat's flash estimate, euro area annual HICP inflation increased in November 2013 to 0.9% from 0.7% in October. The increase was broadly as expected and reflected in particular an upward base effect in energy prices and higher services price inflation. On the basis of prevailing futures price for energy, annual inflation rates are expected to remain at around current levels in the coming months. Over the medium term, underlying price pressures in the euro area are expected to remain subdued. At the same time, inflation expectations for the euro area over the medium to long term continue to be firmly anchored in line with our aim of maintaining inflation rates below but close to 2%. Broadly in line with this assessment, the December 2013 Eurosystem staff macroeconomic projections for the euro area foresee annual HICP inflation at 1.4% in 2013, at 1.1% in 2014, and at 1.3% in 2015. So 1.4% in 13, 1.1% in 14, 1.3% in 15. In comparison with the September 2013 ECB staff macroeconomic projections, the projection for inflation for 2013 has been revised downwards by 0.1 percentage point, and for 2014, it has been revised downwards by 0.2 percentage points. The risk to the outlook for price developments are seen to be broadly balanced over the medium term. Upside risks relate to higher commodity prices and stronger than expected increases in administrative prices and indirect taxes, while downside risks stem from weaker than expected economic activity. Concerning the staff macroeconomic projections, let me inform you that the Governing Council has decided to publish more details as of December 2013. So you will receive this material today after the press conference. Turning to the monetary analysis, data for October confirmed the assessment of <coughs> subdued underlying growth in broad money, M3, and credit. Annual growth, growth in M3 moderated to 1.4% in October from 2% in September. This moderation was partly based, partly related to a base effect. Annual growth in M1 remained strong at 6.6%, reflecting a preference for liquidity, although it was below the peak of 8.7% observed in April. Net capital inflows into the euro area continued to be the main factor supporting annual M3 growth, while the annual rate of change of loans to the private sector remained weak. The annual growth rate 
of loans to households stood at plus 0.3% in October, broadly unchanged since the beginning of the year. The annual rate of change of loans to the non-financial corporations was minus 2.9% in October, following minus 2.8% in September and minus 2.9% in August. Overall, weak loan dynamics for non-financial corporations continue to reflect their lagged relationship with the business cycle, credit risk, and the ongoing adjustment of financial and non-financial sector balance sheets. Since the summer of 2012, substantial progress has been made in improving the funding situation of banks. In order to ensure an adequate transmission of monetary policy to the financing conditions in Euro area countries, it is essential that the fragmentation of Euro area credit markets declines further and that the resilience of banks is strengthened where needed. The ECB's comprehensive assessment before it adopts its supervisory role under the single supervisory mechanism will further support this confidence-building process. It will enhance the quality of information available on the condition of banks and result in the identification and implementation of necessary corrective actions. Further decisive steps to establish a banking union will help to restore confidence in the financial system. To sum up, the economic analysis indicates that we may experience a prolonged period of low inflation to be followed by a gradual upward movement towards inflation rates below but close to 2% later on. A cross-check with the signals from the monetary analysis confirms this picture. As regards fiscal policies, the Governing Council welcomes the European Commission's assessment of the 2014 draft budgetary plans, which were submitted in October for the first time under the two PAC re regulations. This new surveillance exercise needs to be fully effective. In order to put high public debt ratios on a downward path, governments should not unravel their efforts to reduce deficits and sustain fiscal adjustment over the medium term. In particular, consolidation measures should be growth friendly and have a medium term perspective so as both to improve public services and minimize the distortionary effects of taxation. At the same time, there is need to push ahead with product and labor market reforms in order to improve competitiveness, raise potential growth, generate employment opportunities, and foster the adaptability of our economies. We are now at your disposal for questions. Thank you very much. Sakari Suoninen from Reuters. Um, Mr. Draghi, my first question would be... It would be great to see you. <laughs> Here in the back. Oh, okay, okay, so way in the back. Yes. I'm hiding cheap seats. Um, you said you see 2015 inflation at 1. 3%. Um, recently, you've talked about your need to act in November as an inflation buffer. Do you now see that you have enough of a buffer so that it is uh, that deflation threat is not uh, acute? And uh, also re related to that uh, forecast, you said that you see inflation climbing to the ECB's target of just below 2%. Still, the highest we have is 1.3 in 2015. Is this good enough for you? And my second question would be... That's the third question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they were related, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mr. Constancia, you said that um, negative deposit rates would be only used in extreme circumstances. Could one of you maybe give us a better idea of what, cons what constitutes extreme circumstances? Okay. Thank you. 
we, um, well, the first, uh, the first message I want to leave with you today is that uh, after our uh, rate cut, well, first of all, our decision to cut rates in November last, last time uh, has shown to be fully justified. And uh, the first message is that, in fact, our forward guidance is working. Our lower rate, our confirmation of the fixed rate full allotment extended in 2015, have led market expectations to conclude that our monetary policy stance uh, uh, will stay accommodative for an extended period of time. The forward curve is now back where it was in uh, May. Uh, there have been, uh, and, and we are, by the way, we are, uh, we are content, as you can see, with this, with this development. It's uh, uh, a development which is fully justified by the subdued outlook for inflation in the medium term. And um, also, it has shown greater clarity in our reaction function. Other positive consequences of that, uh, of this, this, this set of decisions is I commented on the Ionia curve and the slope of the Euribor curve. The yields of many non-core government bond yields, uh, uh, the yields of many non-core non government bonds have gone down. Uh, senior unsecured bank bond yields have gone down. Bank bond issuance, even for stressed countries like, uh, for example, Portugal and Ireland, uh, have picked up, has, yeah, have picked up, and uh, all this without impact on the equity markets. So there are many more dimensions that I can comment on this. We also saw some uh, slight reduction in fragmentation. We also saw, after two months of stabilization, today uh, data show a, de a renewed decline in target two. Uh, we also saw a, basically a stabilization of cross-border uh, cross relations uh, flows at the level that they had pre-crisis. So all in all, uh, we're seeing uh, positive developments uh, both before but especially after our decision last November. For example, we are seeing um, negative net issuance of government bonds. Uh, and all this without appreciable consequence on the yields of these bonds. So um, we've seen, we've seen, well, we, we, we can comment on this uh, later on. Now, uh, all this happens, and here I'm addressing your second question, your second, well, first 1B uh, question. Uh, all this happens in a situation where uh, basically inflation expectations remain firmly anchored in the medium to long term. As both uh, markets but also survey indicators show. The second consideration is that while we see the HICP path as I've uh, just discussed with you a moment ago to be what it is, uh, we also see that inflation excluding food and energy drifts slightly higher during the uh, horizon. And uh, the final point that I want to make is that uh, it'd be wrong to think, as, as it is wrong to think, that we decide our monetary policy on one figure of inflation. As you can see, this has not been the case, as it's been confirmed by subsequent data. It'd also be wrong to think that the effect of our monetary policy is instantaneous. It's everything but that. There is, it needs time to uh, fully produce its effects. And, um, and we may comment on this later, by the way. Uh, the time, the extension, the length of time that it takes depends uh, on many factors, but certainly on a couple of factors very important. What is the state of the bank's balance sheets? And what is the state of the private sector balance sheets? The, the greater is the, the leveraging process that both actors, banks on one side and corporates, and, uh, and corporates on the other side, have to take, the longer will be the time that our monetary policy will take to exert its full impulse. And that is why the AQR, the Asset Quality Review, is so important, because actually it can shorten 
this time. But we can come back on this later on. Please. Joanna Trick, Market News. Joanna Trick. Um, I've got two questions for you. Number one, um, earlier this year you said you would uh, give us, uh, update us with news on a potential release of minutes or summaries of uh, your deliberations on the Governing Council. As you pointed out, this is the last meeting this year and we still didn't hear anything or can you actually enlighten us whether there had been a decision? Um, my second question is the ECB Governing Council members have cited a number of possible policy measures, um, including negative interest rates and quantitative easing, some of which would be seen as um, very extreme, especially in the context of the Eurozone. Nobody has ever mentioned the option of uh, forex interventions, though. Does that mean that that's not a tool that the ECB would be ready to consider? Thank you very much. Thank you. On the first thing is, on the first question about the minutes, we, we, are, we have started working in the executive board and we are continuing to work. It's a very complex issue. It, doesn't, uh, it has many dimensions. The one that's most popular is whether the names of who does what ought to be there. But there are many other issues, for, especially for an institution that never had minutes before. So we are preparing our proposal for the governing council, which, by the way, today has, has already discussed uh, to, some, to a little extent, to some extent, this issue already. So we are moving forward with slight late, and it, the delay is justified by the complexity of the issue, frankly. On, on the second point, uh, uh, well, you know what the policy of the ECB and the other major central banks is? Uh, exchange rates are a matter of common concern, so they, uh, they, they, and they are not, they're not a policy target, by the way, I've said this on and on. So they're not a policy target. Our policy target is price stability in the medium term. However, the exchange rates are important for price stability, as we are seeing today, and for growth. So we keep this into account in our monetary policy decisions. The, uh, the experience of uh, what you are saying, unilateral forex intervention, is not contemplated by the current G20 agreements. Thank you. Annette Weisbach, CNBC. Thank you very much. Mm. My first question would be actually on um, the potential new LTRO, or if you would consider something like the Bank of England's program funding for lending, above all looking at the ever-decreasing lending activities uh, as an aggregate. And my second question would be, you're always saying that you're watching money markets very carefully and you have all available instruments at your hands or in your hands. What has to happen to use those instruments? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think I'll, I can respond to both, both questions with one answer. Um, the, our discussion today uh, has not, basically the message is, the message the Governing Council sends today is that we are ready and able to act uh, within the forward guidance framework. Forward guidance is there. The, um, we have not identified amongst the um, various uh, numerous instruments we have, one specific instrument in the discussion we had today. Uh, we, have, uh, we had a brief discussion about negative deposit rates, but it was brief. That is one, one, one point I want to make. So readiness to act, ability to act within the framework of the forward guidance, but a variety of instruments ready, technically ready, uh, they've been worked out, uh, so they are there. Brief discussion on negative deposit rates. On the LTRO uh, specifically, you mentioned, I would take this opportunity to make a point here. When we made the LTRO two years ago, the level of uncertainty was very high. And therefore, the long-term long-term liquidity, three years term liquidity, was justified by that level of uncertainty. Furthermore, the LTRO, we view the LTRO as a, as a very successful monetary policy measure. Uh, it did avoid uh, severe further credit contractions at the time due to lack of funding. 
The funding situation was extremely stressed. You remember, I've told you several times, we had 250 billion euros of bank bonds due within one term, within one quarter, and we had more than 300 billion of government bonds coming due within the same quarter. And this was coming after the second part of 2011, which had been a, a period of increasing dramatic stress, of, of stress incre dramatically increasing. Now, today, the situation is, fortunately, substantially different. The level of uncertainty is considerably lower. And that is one consideration to keep in mind. The second consideration is that the use that these banks have made of this liquidity was mostly for buying government bonds. And uh, it's, I think, uh, basically a, a fact, of, a fact of, of, of this experience that uh, not much of this actually found its way through the economy. So if we are to do an operation similar to the LTRO, we'll want to make sure that uh, this is being used for the economy. And we want to make sure that this operation is not going to be used for subsidizing capital formation by the banking system under this carry trade operations. Thank you. Brian Blackstone, Wall Street Journal. Brian Blackstone with the Wall Street Journal. Can, I want to get back to this point about all these numerous policy options you have, and maybe you could give us some verbal meeting minutes and just run down them and just give us a sense of what the state of play is on the thinking, for example, negative deposit rates. You talked about it briefly. What would you talk about? Asset purchases. What kind of discussion do you have about these things, and why are they good ideas, and why aren't you really implementing some of these yet? My second question, I want to go back to something you said last month about the fundamentals in the Eurozone being probably the strongest in the world. If that's the case, why wouldn't, first of all, why do you have such a weak economic growth forecast, just 1.5% in 2015, but wouldn't an economy with such good fundamentals respond to stimulus from the ECB, from fiscal policy? Thank you. Thank you. On, on the first, I really have to say again what I said before. No specific inst instruments been identified by our discussion, uh, and the I would say the level of preparedness is uh, is pretty high on on all of them. Uh, so we 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 don't uh, we don't think further we don't think uh, we we don't know we don't need any further analysis on that. Uh, but uh, then the key question is, any use any further use of these instruments would this be justified? by the current uh, medium-term assess assessment of medium-term outlook for inflation or not? I think that's the key question. As I said, after our decision in November, we've seen that um, the markets have responded. The impact has been quite strong to our forward guidance, and this has worked. And inflation expectations are firmly anchored. So we will, however, having said that, we'll certainly closely monitor any developments, and let me say that we are fully aware of the downside risks that a protracted period of low inflation, of low inflation for an extended period of time, does imply. The, um, the second point is, I, yes, in a sense, in a sense, the, uh, the fundamentals of the euro area are, are, are strong in a sense because the major policy mistakes of the previous years are on the way to be corrected. The, the euro area can afford doing the structural reforms it needs. In this sense, the fundamentals are strong. To generate growth, you need stimulus, but you also need to correct the structural imbalances. You have to under, you, you, not you, the governments of the euro area, the ones who need, have to undertake the structural reforms they have to do. There is no doubt that low growth is the outcome of uh, economies that need to have structural reforms, in both, the, as, as the introductory statements just said, both in the product 
and in the labor markets, but not only there. In many other sectors, in education, the judiciary. So it depends. Each country has, uh, in a sense, their own specific list uh, of work that they have to do. And um, so the stimulus, we have discovered, by the way, that uh, neither growth nor equity can be expected on, from endless debt creation. So uh, when we use the word stimulus, uh, we've got to be very, very careful here. And uh, the reality is that the, the economies have to be prepared, structurally prepared, for the stimulus to actually produce its effect in a, in a, in a sustainable way. Thank you. Jean-Philippe Lacour, Les Echos. President. Yes, um, you said before you discussed briefly about uh, the negative deposit rate. And since uh, I hear some voices that here in this house that uh, if you go into this negative uh, territorium, then parallel to a rate cut, both uh, interest, I mean, um, main interest, yes, will be then lowered simultaneously with uh, going to this uh, negative territorium. So my question is, was today a discussion uh, about this both uh, decisions at the same time? I mean, uh, there was a discussion about, uh, about rate cut, and if uh, not... Okay, that is the first question. And the second one, um, about exchange rates. In uh, February uh, 2013, uh, exchange rates uh, were mentioned in the statement as uh, risks, downside risks for the, the growth. Um, this is not the case since. So um, do we have to consider that exchange rates are not really a risk, but so, uh, um, at the time in February, the exchange rate dollar was 135 with the euro, nearly the same like, like today. So it, eurozone must come along with this high exchange rate. It is not really as, uh, as a risk. Thank you. Uh, no, on, on, when I said no on your to your first question is that we, we didn't have, we had a brief discussion which was not in any sort of depth or any, didn't touch on any technical aspect of, uh, of, this, uh, of this measure, possible measure. Um, on the second point, uh, I said basically uh, the fact that uh, the statement isn't there doesn't mean anything. Uh, I mean, the exchange rate is, uh, is, as I said, is important for price stability and growth. And the levels are, by and large, the ones that uh, were there when uh, when the statement was in. So we are we are watching we are watching the exchange rate, and uh, it's one. Of, but, but keep in mind again and again, it's not a policy target. It's part of our information set that leads us to take monetary policy decisions. The objective of which is price stability in the medium term. Thank you. Margarita Peixoto from Economico. Good afternoon. Uh, we are uh, in Portugal. We are six months from ending the adjustment program. Uh, in what conditions do you see Portugal exiting this program? And uh, second question, if you think that a negative decision from the Constitutional Court might question this exit. Thank you. Thank you. I would say the, the progress in Portugal uh, has been very, very significant. The government and the economy and the population have uh, uh, made an extraordinary progress in uh, addressing the shortcomings that were present at the beginning of the crisis. And the prospects for a return to market financing have clearly improved. It's also quite clear that uh, a strong implementation of the program conditionality is absolutely essential and should be continued. So that's what I can say at this point in time. The one has to uh, keep in mind that the initial structural weaknesses of the Portuguese economy were very serious, were very serious. And um, 
So this implies a much more complex program of adjustment uh, within which, I have to say, the Portugal, uh, Portuguese government has done uh, significant, has achieved significant progress. And also I would like to ask Constancio, Vitor, mm -hmm. if you have, uh, you, you, you know, uh, you know, you know well, something about uh, Portugal, so. <laughs> yeah, you said it all uh, in what regards the uh, progress in the adjustment, which is uh, clear uh, in particular in what regards the external accounts that uh, came from a big deficit to a situation of uh, balance and even a small surplus, which is uh, now foreseen. Uh, that was, of course, a very costly adjustment, but it was done. Also, uh, progress in the fiscal uh, position uh, of the country in terms of reduction of deficits. So, also in terms of competitiveness indicators, all these uh, components of the adjustment have, have been achieved. Uh, and now uh, everyone, uh, meaning uh, all the international institutions, are uh, forecasting some growth for next year, which is the result uh, of what has been achieved. Mark Schroes, Börsenzeitung. Mark Schroes with Börsenzeitung, thank you. Uh, my first question is on, um, you said that the decision um, has shown to be fully justified, the November decision, including the interest rate cut. Um, is this an assessment that was shared by all governing council members today, as we know that there have been some divergence of views last month? And my second question is, um, you said that the quick question for further action would be whether they are justified or not. Um, uh, regarding that, all the um, that negative deficit rate and also quantitative easing are seen as very extreme instruments. Would you say that these instruments are only justified if there is a serious deflation threat for the euro uh, zone as a whole, or would it also be an option just to support the economy if uh, growth is too low and inflation is low? Thank you. Thank you. Well, first, uh, to the first question, I, I mean, once we take a vote about a decision, we never take a vote to decide, the, say, three weeks, three weeks later whether that decision was justified or not. So we, we vote only once, basically. We had voted. We, we rarely vote. We, we sort of, sometimes we did, like last, like last time. But uh, I should say, and you should know, because it was a public statement, that uh, the disagreement at that time was whether to do it then or later. It was not in substance, so much so that some of the ones who disagreed at that time later stated fully that it was fully justified. So it's, uh, and uh, going beyond uh, um, council members' views and opinions, I, when I say it's fully justified, I look at the facts, at the market's reaction, at the rates, at list of things that I briefly commented before, bank bonds issuance, yields, and so on. The repositioning of the forward curve to what it was in May. So that is the point. On the second point, uh, and you're actually asking a very hard question to answer. Which instrument would we deploy against which contingency? And uh, we, we, are not, uh, we haven't really done any reflection on that. We know we have a powerful uh, artillery of different instruments yet available. We do believe that our decision uh, last in the last uh, Governing Council monetary policy uh, decision was, uh, as I said, uh, right. And uh, the subsequent events have shown that uh, uh, that was justified, that our forward guidance uh, has been substantially successful. That um, um, in, in a context of, uh, of uh, inflation expectations, which remain fully anchored, in a context of an inflation constellation that I've described before, where the known food and energy components drift slightly higher. So, and in a context where uh, we, we have to acknowledge that our monetary policy decisions are taking time to exert their inputs. So, that's, that's the state of ours, and we, frankly, uh, it's, it's too early to speculate uh, for such, uh, for such um, future course of action. Beatrice Navarro Abues from La Vanguardia. Christina asked me to stay longer, by the way, today. Yeah. 
Thank you. A question for President um, Draghi, please. As you may be aware of, um, the letter that, just, that your predecessor, Mr. Trichet, sent uh, to the Spanish government in the early days of August 2011 was just published as part of the memoirs of former Prime Minister Zapatero. How, do, uh, how did you assess uh, what's your opinion on the publication of a restricted document in a book with commercial purposes? And also, if you could remind us why this document, where an EU institution gives uh, recommendations on fiscal and economic policy had to remain in, in secret. And if I may, a quick uh, follow-up question on your, on your comments on the LTRO. Should a, a new one take place, how do you intend to control the use that the banks make of the money? You cannot market the notes, so thank you. Let me respond to the second question first. You're absolutely right. That is, uh, that is uh, there, are, there are two dimensions to, to decisions like this. The first is when it's needed. I, I didn't say anything about this to be needed tomorrow. Uh, we're just uh, sort of in abstract, regardless of when. Uh, the second dimension is uh, its uh, um, practicality, its uh, capacity to actually achieve the targets for which it's been designed. Now, work has been done on this front, but this is exactly one reason why. And I, I remember discussing with you this uh, a year ago, a year and a half ago, when you were asking the same question. Why, have, why haven't, you, haven't you linked this to, to actual uh, credit? Um, and, and the thing is that it's, as, you, as we've seen in UK, it's already complex in one country framework. In a 17, 18 countries framework, it's going to be even more complicated. And but I, as I said, work has been done on this too, but we should not uh, ignore the practical complications stemming from a measures from generally measures like these. It's um, yeah, it's like when people say, "Ah, the ECB should buy assets." Say so which assets? And I don't want to start a discussion on that, but that's, that's, another, that's another thing. You can like this in theory. In practice, you have to ask yourself, what do you mean? And, uh, and so, but as I said, lots of work, reflection, papers have been written on this. So when time comes, we, we're going to be ready, if this time will ever come. Please. I'm sorry, on the letter, I'd rather, frankly, do not comment on these. These are really uh, um, uh, issues specific to a certain country, and I just don't want to comment on that, please. Tonia Mastroboni, La Stampa. No, no longer. Alessandro Merli, Il Sole. Alessandro. Alessandro Merli of Il Sole, 24 Ore. An opinion is expected of the ECB on the recent uh, changes announced in Italy to the Bank of Italy shareholding structure. Uh, could you tell us if you have this opinion? When is it going to be published? And can you tell us uh, what it is? Uh, you also mentioned numerous options. Uh, several were already uh, mentioned, like negative deposit rates, uh, and uh, some form of uh, purchasing assets. Uh, are you also considering uh, stopping or at least reducing the amount of sterilization that you do of the S&P uh, purchases? No, on, the, on, the, on the point, on the first question, the opinion has, uh, the ECB opinion as its current practice has been circulated to all the uh, national central banks in uh, what it is a written procedure and uh, comments, uh, uh, the national central banks are, you, as its current practice, expected to send their comments. Uh, I don't know, I frankly ignore what is the state of this written procedure. The opinion has not been adopted yet, so that's the state of, uh, of the situation now. On, um, I'm sorry, the other question was? Oh, the S&P. Well, uh, we are. I mean, we are. We have marginally touched on this as well today. Uh, we we have discussed the. There are two issues there. One is the uh, liquidity creation that would accompany such a measure. The other one is to uh, the awareness the, that this liquidity creation uh, takes place, or the liquidity absorption anyway, takes place in a context of fixed rate full allotment. And so the two tends, tend to compensate each other. Uh, so we are, we are, we are sort of uh, reflecting on this issue. Hi, Jones. Pauline 
Financial Times. Um, Mr. Draghi, in both your opening statement and in your, um, in your comments today, you placed a lot of weight on inflation expectations in the medium to longer term remaining yeah. anchored around the target. But in Japan, those expectations moved a little bit late. They didn't really tell us anything that we, y y until it was too late for the central bank to do anything. I mean, given that, how appropriate is it that you're placing so much faith in these inflate, inflation expectations in warranting not doing more now? And just a second question, if I may. Um, you've mentioned in recent weeks that lower than target inflation in the periphery may be appropriate given that it's a corollary of more competitiveness. But at the same time, you said that inflation in the Eurozone overall needs to be anchored around the target. How can you say that inflation that's a third below target over the monetary policy relevant horizon is really a suitable anchor there? Thank you. Um, on, on the first question, uh, I think that the situation is in, in the euro area is uh, quite different from what it was in Japan in the 90s and early 2000s. Let me give you a few reasons. The first is actually what we've just discussed. We've taken, uh, f uh, if you look at what we've done in the last uh, year, year and a half, we've taken uh, decisive monetary policy measures of great significance at the very early stage, even when, it, as a matter of fact, inflation was not at uh, the levels at which it is today. It was, was way higher and way closer to 2%. So, and this was not, didn't happen in Japan. The second reason why, uh, why, by the way, this is an interesting comparison, which you can imagine, we sort of look at it with, with, great, uh, with great attention. But there's a second reason why this, this, uh, this comparison isn't actually there, at least. I, uh, the, we are in the process of actually doing the AQR. You're aware that the situation in Japan lasted much longer than it should have because the balance sheets of the banking system and of the private sector were burdened and had to be delevered. And the action to conduce, to induce this deleveraging lagged for many years. The AQR will, is expected to produce this action. And if, as a matter of fact, this action has already started, uh, is actually in, in its course right now. Much of it, uh, well, some of it is actually taking place before, even before the AQR is being implemented. So that's, that's the second reason. The third reason is that the situation of the private sector balance sheets is not at all comparable uh, of, in the euro area is not at all comparable with what it was in Japan at that time. The fourth reason is that uh, the countries in the euro area have made significant progress in addressing their structural weaknesses. Now, in some countries, the progress towards structural reforms have been slower, in other countries, faster. But you see that the situation today is completely different from what it was two years ago. And that's a fourth reason of difference between uh, Japan of the 90s, 2000s with, uh, with us today. But there is one fifth reason. As a matter of fact, if you look at inflation expectations in the euro area uh, and the corresponding con inflation rates, you would see that in Japan, the inflation expectations were disanchored quite, uh, uh, quite significantly and for a long period of time, which is not something we've seen today. Your second question was about uh, whether the, uh, whether the, oh, yes, yes. Uh, well, certainly, I mean, that's why we acted. I mean, we acted because we think that the outlook, the medium-term outlook for inflation is subdued and stays subdued for a long period of time. And as a consequence, it makes the adjustment, the relative price adjustment across countries more difficult. There's absolutely no doubt that it's much easier to adjust if you have an inflation of 
than if you have an inflation of zero because of the rigidity of price and wages, the downward rigidity of nominal price and nominal wages. And that's why we, why we acted, and that's why we, as I said before, we are very aware of the downside risks that a protracted low rate, that the low rate of inflation, that a too low rate of inflation for a, for a protracted period of time might have. And that's why we stand ready to act. Domenico, Domenico Conti, answer. Draghi. Okay. Among the uh, the broad range of instruments that the ECB has, the, the, the artillery that you referred to, my, my understanding is that there's also, just as part of a discussion, the possibility of proceeding to some kind of quantitative easing. So my question is, uh, I don't want you to get into details of this because I know it's not possible, it's just a discussion, but in case this would happen, would it, uh, would it be would those asset purchases only focus on uh, uh, bank securities? Bank securities because the ECB already has in place a program for government bonds, that is the, the OMT. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I, I'm sorry, but I have to say what I said before. We have not identified any specific instrument in today's discussion. We only... Uh, as I said, the message is we have, they are, we have instruments, they are there, they are, there, is, there is a sizable variety of instruments and, uh, and, that's, and we are ready and able to act within our forward guidance framework. Thank you. Philip Plickert, FAZ. Thank you, uh, Mr. Draghi. I have a question concerning the asset quality review with the uh, specific aim of uh, rebuilding confidence in, in the balance sheets of, of banks. And I might come back to the point already briefed, uh, briefly touched on by previous speaker. Um, the move in Italy to uh, revalue the, the shares of the Bank of Italy. And secondly, in, in Spain, uh, the recent decision by the finance ministry to allow to to uh, convert uh, deferred tax assets uh, into capital backed by a government uh, guarantee in, in case the banks are not making enough uh, losses so the deferred tax assets actually materialize. So do you think these two moves, which are unrelated and uh, two different cases and each of which must be uh, considered of its own, but they kind of, in, in, in the press you, you read like there's a certain pattern of uh, creative accounting in the in the in the run up of the balance sheet assessment do you agree on this or do you do you completely uh, disagree we will come uh, we will come to discuss these specific measures when we'll actually come to examine first of all some of them uh, bo probably both of them are not in place yet so and they are they are not laws as far as uh, the italian one is not the law at all i don't know about the spanish one so we will discuss them when they, when they come into being and we'll discuss their impact. But let me make a more general point about the AQR. AQR is useful if it's credible. If it's not credible, it, and to, mean, to say that it's credible, it means that it will shed light onto the bank's balance sheets so that the private sector will find convenient, profitable, to invest money in the banking industry of the euro area or to lend money in the banking industry, to the banking industry in the euro area. And banks will find a feasible proposition to lend and borrow from each other. I think that's the ultimate test of credibility. It's quite clear that the more we trick around with concepts, the less the test will, uh, the, the less, in a sense, the, 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 the outcome will be credible. So we have to be, whatever comes, we will be, we'll be judging uh, uh, all these developments in, in their own, uh, according to their own merit and substance. We'll have to see what that is, but the general line is that the ECB and, the, and, and, and all the other parties that work on this exercise uh, want to achieve a fully transparent exercise. And, and, and that's also the reason why someone else asked before this communication 
with the private sector about this process will be continuous. Thank you. Solène Poilec, AGFI. The European Commission fined several banks yesterday. Um, I wonder how concerned are you by the benchmark rates uh, rigging scandal for the financial stability and the, the transmission of the monetary policy? Yeah, well, uh, it's, uh, it's really a matter for the Commission to answer. It's not a matter for us. We are, this is as far as the uh, fines, the fraud, the criminal aspect of this is, is really a matter for the Commission. If we look at, the, uh, the, at, the, at, the, at this from another viewpoint, another angle, namely the, what all this does to the reference rate, uh, would say, again, it's a matter for the Commission to uh, elaborate a reference rate that could stand uh, against uh, all these negative developments and come out uh, to be stronger with respect to these things. And the ECB is working together with the Commission. So we are not in a driving seat. We certainly work in, we're working with them and uh, because reference rate is an important concept for, for a central bank. Thank you. Jack Ewing, International New York Times. Mr. Draghi, um, you may have seen today that uh, the uh, U.S. GDP growth was uh, uh, faster than expected, and that's bound to increase speculation uh, that tapering will come sooner than people had expected. And I'm wondering uh, uh, what consequences you might see for the Eurozone if, in fact, the Fed starts tapering sooner than people had expected, and uh, how concerned are you about that? Thank you. Thank you. Generally, uh, I mean, I, we're not commenting on uh, on other central banks' monetary policy actions, but on the consequences, I, what I can say and what the facts show is there have been quite limited spillovers at the time when, you remember, when it was uh, in, I uh, can't remember, June, July? Uh, May, May, when it, when it all, all of a, looked, all of a sudden, looked as if, this tapering could be could be happening sooner rather than later. Uh, there were not extensive consequences on the on the bond markets and ge more generally in the financial markets of the euro areas. While the consequences of an emerging market countries were actually much more visible and uh, and significant. Uh, second point is that that uh, ex the, precisely that that episode might have injected a an early repricing of assets which actually could uh, further protect from unwanted consequences uh, the, the euro area. Thank you. Gentleman in the middle. Yes. Uh, Very good day. Paul Gordon from Bloomberg News. And um, just come back to uh, the, uh, the, the meeting that you've just had. It wasn't clear to me if anyone at all at that meeting was calling for either a cut or an increase in one of your key one of your three official rates. So I wonder if you could answer that. And secondly, as you go forward, if you do see the need for more easing on your main rates, are you now considering smaller steps? Because if you, obviously if you take a quarter point cut from the current benchmark here at zero, would you consider uh, smaller cuts in that or the deposit rate? Well, on the, fir the first question is, in a sense, I answered. There was basically no proposal to cut rates the, for the reasons that I've explained that our decision last month was, uh, was justified by facts and had produced exactly the uh, desired outcomes. And, uh, and given uh, all the reasons I gave about inflation, the inflationary environment, and uh, the time for our monetary policy decisions to needed to, for them to uh, exert, uh, to explain to the, the final effects, there was no no sense in having uh, in having a discussion of another policy action today. Um, on the other, I would say I have to answer in, in the same way I've answered several times. We we have a full array of instruments, and I rather use the word array rather than artillery because it's just it comes it's this militaristic language. That uh, array of instruments and uh, panoplia also would be okay. <laughs> 
Um, and, uh, but we haven't identified anyone specifically today. Thank you. I'll give a final question to the gentleman here in the middle. Uh, good afternoon. I'd uh, just like to ask about the SSM. I understand... Could you just please state your name oh, and your, the function? Uh, Tristan Carlyle from Central Banking Publications. Uh, Daniel Noy has been uh, given the approval from the, economic, uh, the Co Committee of Economic and Monetary Affairs today, and that leaves the position of Vice Chair, which I understand the Executive Board will be nominating one of its members. Uh, could you perhaps comment on the progress towards that and whether more than one member has expressed an interest in the job? I can silly comment on that. We are, we are reflecting on this. Uh, we are, we'd also want to talk to Danielle and uh, we'll see also what her views will be. And uh, so that's the, certainly the, uh, our conviction is uh, that um, the, super, uh, the sooner the supervisory board is put in place, the better it is. We are, by the, incidentally, it, we already have the benefit of the national competent authorities experience in supervision because there is what we, what's called a high level group of supervisors where they are, which they attend. I chair these meetings and, and they, they really are very active in uh, making the SSM progress in, and uh, in working on the AQR. So there are two, uh, I would say two uh, branches of uh, action. One is the preparation for the SSM and the other one is the preparation for the AQR and the stress test. They are all present there, and uh, I think I take this opportunity for thanking both the national authorities, but also the ECB staff, which has been, uh, which both of them being wonderful in the amount of work that been done, they've done so far. If you think it's, it's not an insignificant amount of work to do an AQR for more than 130 banks across 17 or 18 countries, or to create ex novo an organization, an institution which is going to supervise the banks, all the banks of the 17 and 18 countries in close cooperation and using the national experiences. Thank you.